Today we're talking about Psalm chapter 50. And, and I want to take a moment just to um, talk about Psalm 50, but from the standpoint of type before we get into the actual, uh, the actual chapter itself. One of the things you should know, and, and Jeff and I were just talking about sermons uh, just a second ago, but the goal of any good sermon is to point people to the gospel of Jesus Christ and encourage people to deepen their relationship with God, to be changed by the gospel. If you want to know my goal, Pastor John's goal, Dr. Paul's goal, any good, any good preacher's goal, that's it. The goal is for you to hear the gospel of Jesus and be changed, period. That's the end of discussion. Now, underneath that, there are a lot of different subsets of the goal, but change necessarily implies there's a reason to change. There's an imperfection, there's a sin, there's a spiritual gap that needs to be addressed. Now, not all sermons do that. Not all sermons point people to Jesus and call people to change as a result of the gospel. Some preachers, and I'm not going to call anybody out. If you want to know, you can come ask me later. I'll call people out privately, but not publicly. Uh, but, not all, but some preachers and some sermons, they're more interested in helping people just feel good. They just feel good about your life. Come out with the, with the, the, the ooey gooey spiritual like, yes, I feel great. I'm, God, I'm a great person and there's nothing that I need to do to change. Uh, worship services become little more than pep rallies for human capacity, human achievement. They'll slap Jesus' name on it, but it's more about the temporal advantages a person can attain in life. Faith as a self-help guide sometimes becomes the, the goal of a sermon in some cases, but not good sermons. For me, a good sermon typically has several movements. There's a general arc. It will begin with addressing some sort of an attachment to the ordinary life of a person. It's designed to help a believer or an unbeliever have an entry point to the gospel to the larger expositional point of the scripture. Then I'll get into the scripture. I'll typically point out the problem that we face, the gap that we experience, the sin problem that we all have. I'll try to illustrate that point. Then I'll move to the gospel solution, how Christ has taken care of our inherent sinfulness and provided a way for us to live into a sanctified life. Finally, I kind of tackle how. How do you live into that sanctified life? How are we to live in light of the gospel? Not to attain salvation, but how do we live in light of salvation? There's something prophetic about the ministry of preaching, not because we're trying to predict the future. That's not what prophets primarily did, even in the Old Testament, but more about calling people to God, away from sin, back to the Lord, and that was the goal of most prophets as well, too. The, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is to talk about Psalm 50. Because in, in, in the Psalms so far, we have seen a variety of different types of Psalms. We've seen Psalms of praise and thanksgiving. We've seen, we've seen Psalms of lament, lamentation. We've seen proverbial or wisdom Psalms, like the one that we talked about last week, Psalm 49. We've seen Psalms focused on the kingship of God, the kingship of God's anointed ambassadors, oftentimes King David. But to this point, we have not really encountered a prophetic psalm. Though some have had prophetic elements, we've not seen a psalm that has prophecy as its general th uh, thrush and, and flow. Psalm 50 is fully a prophetic psalm. From first to last, it's a prophetic psalm. Erhard Gerstenberger, that's a name for you right there. If you want to look this up, I'll give you the spelling later. But Erhard Gerstenberger pointed out that Psalm 50 has a sermonic, a sermon-like effect, as the prophets did as well. It's set directly in the mouth of God. And like many of the prophets, the pronouncements of Psalm 50, they're set up in almost a courtroom-like drama with witnesses and God acting as prosecuting attorney and as judge. Um, psalm 50 is also called a psalm of what? Oh, shoot fire. Sorry, guys. Lost it. It's Psalm 
of what? Asaph. Asaph. This is the first psalm of Asaph that we have seen. Um, we have been uh, reading s- uh, songs or psalms of the sons of Korah up till Psalm 49. Um, and uh, some people have questioned why this psalm of Asaph is set right in the middle of this section. Because what you're going to see, starting with Psalm 51, if you want to flip on over, what is Psalm 51? It's not a psalm of Asaph. What is it? It's a psalm of David. It's actually one of the, next to probably Psalm 23, it's probably the most famous psalm of David. We're going to, I really don't know how we're going to do Psalm 51 in one week. We're going to try. But Psalm, the psalm of, this psalm of Asaph is right in between the psalm of the sons of Korah and the psalm of David. And people have said, why? Why this psalm of Asaph, which is thematically kind of a bit divergent from the previous psalms, but also um, is divergent and separated from the larger collection of psalms of Asaph. From Psalm 73 to Psalm 83, that is, the, that is the prime collection of the Psalms of Asaph, those 11 chapters. So the question is why? There's no real clear answer. Um, however, the mention of Zion in Psalm 50 does connect with Psalm 48. Psalm 48 was a Psalm of Zion, as we saw. And the indictments of Psalm 50, the failures mentioned in Psalm 50, have some connection with Psalm 49. Because what was Psalm 49 all about? What was Psalm 49 all about? It was about... Can't take it with you. you. It was a wisdom psalm. It was a psalm of instruction. Right? And so Psalm 50 is the failure to heed the wisdom of God. But not necessarily specifically the wisdom presented in Psalm 49, but in a general since uh, it was about the wisdom of God. Psalm 50 is about failure to heed the wisdom of God. Asaph, as a person, is mentioned as a song leader in places like 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 39. He's also described as a seer, as in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 30. This perhaps owes to the prophetic nature of, of Psalm 50. Now, the structure of Psalm 50 is kind of easy to identify if you if you read it kind of closely. We see in this psalm two sets of accusations made by God to the people and it and it sets the parameters of judgment. Now, framing those two sections of indictment are an introduction setting the audience of this adjudication process and the right of God to bring forth his case. And then a closing verse in verse 23 uh, that summarizes the entirety of the psalm. Some have wondered uh, at the image of, a le- of the legal process in the prophets. Uh, if you look at the prophets, a lot of the prophets, they, they, out, they lay out their, their prophecies against groups of people like court proceedings. Like, like God is a prosecuting attorney. He has done his investigative work. He's bringing forth a case against his people or some other uh, people. And he's prosecuting the judgment as well. He's instituting the judgment as well. So you'll say, why? Why doesn't God just say, you're bad. You deserve punishment. Here's your punishment. Why does God, why do the prophets go through such a, a kind of metaphorical lengths to demonstrate this proceeding? But actually, I think this kind of imagery has been present since the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, does it shock anybody that I'm talking about Genesis now? In Genesis chapter 3, if you remember way back, this is like five years ago, and I'm not exaggerating, this is like five years ago, God investigates the crime of Adam and Eve. Do you remember this? What happens? Adam and Eve fail in the garden. They eat the fruit they're not supposed to eat. When God shows up, how does God show up? Does he show up in thunder and lightning and clouds and just strike them down? What does he do? He walks into the garden and he asks questions. Where are you? Where are you? 
Who told you this? He's, he's inve- now, does God know the answers to all those questions even before they're asked? Does God need to ask the question? He does not. He's all-knowing. But he does it anyway. He investigates the crime against his law. His law has been broken. They only have one rule, by the way. They only have one law, and they broke it. One law, don't eat from this one tree. Any other tree, go to town. This one tree, don't eat it. They broke that law. So God investigates the crime. This is a crime, and God investigates it. He shows in that investigation his fairness. Even in the midst of his justice in convicting the sin. And Psalm 50 and all the prophets show that God has that same motivation. He is just in his assessment of sin and violations against holiness and righteousness. He's just in his judgment against those sin. But he's also demonstrating he's fair. He gives the opportunity for the criminal to answer. Now, God doesn't have to do that. But he does it anyway. Because he's fair. And he's just. So the image of the courtroom proceedings demonstrates that God's justice is a fair assessment. Now, Peter Craigie contends this psalm was used as a part of a specially called set of ceremonies to renew the covenant with the people of God. And while that certainly may have been the case, others have noted that in the post-exilic context, the regular liturgy of the Jewish uh, uh, people, the Jewish worship, would have focused on covenant fidelity anyway because they'd just come out of a time where their covenant infidelity had caused a major rift between them and the promises of God. Because of their failures, God had pronounced the judgment that was given throughout all the prophets that they'd be taken into exile. And then coming back out of exile, they wanted to constantly remember the why. The why. Now, with that said, one of the things I think Craigie does not do because of his view on the, the covenant fidelity renewal is that he doesn't attend to the legal metaphors very well in his assessment. And so I think he, he misses some of the themes. There are definitely covenant themes because God's assessment of judgment is always based on the covenant agreement. God has put forward a covenant to his people. The people have over and over again said they agree. They've spoken, yes, we will, we will follow. And over and over again, they fail to do what they've said to do. So it's based on a covenant agreement that God can pronounce these sorts of judgment. So verses 1 through 6 open up by kind of setting the scene, the the audience scene, and God's right to bring this judgment. So I'm going to read this uh, to you, and then we're going to point out some different, uh, different aspects of it. It says, The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. The psalm opens with a robust reference to God in three unique terms. He's called, in the English, the Mighty One, God, the Lord. Now, in the original language, this is actually three designations for the word God. The first, Mighty One, is actually the word El. And then God is the plural of that, Elohim, and then the Lord is the name. So it's El Elohim Yahweh. That's That's the opening of this psalm. This Imagery underscores the universal power and acknowledgement of God. He is the universally acknowledged God. And what the people of God understand with the use of the covenant name Lord is that the God that all people declare is the ultimate God, that's their God. The ultimate God is their God. There's really no other gods, but 
the ultimate God is their God. And as a result, he is the creator God. Verses 1 through 3, this section right here, would remind the people of God's appearance at Mount Sinai. This, this we call a theophany. There's imagery of a sunrise, which would have indicated that this psalm, if it was used in a liturgical setting, may have been used at the beginning of the day. Or it may demonstrate, and I think this is more likely, that the very power of light comes from the presence of God. From this presence, God speaks. Notice this. All of this happens. He does not keep silence. Around him is a devouring fire. And from this, he calls the heavens above and the earth. Now, again, this is a Genesis image. This is, this is creation imagery. God speaks. The word summons right here is the same word used in Genesis 1 and 2 where God calls forth the heavens and the earth. But in this case, in, in Psalm 50, he's not calling them into being. What is he calling them to do? He's calling them to be witnesses, calling them to be witnesses as he judges the people. The heavens and the earth are called as actual judges of the people. Now, this would make sense to the people of God. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when the people are renewing their covenant before God, Moses, or the Lord, actually calls the heavens and the earth to witness their covenant agreement. They say yes and amen. We're going to follow the covenant. And because in, in, in Deuteronomy 32, God himself has called the heavens and the earth to witness against the people or, or to, to witness their agreement to the covenant, he can call them here to say, hey, um, hey, you trees out there in the uh, national forests, uh, you remember when my people said that they were going to agree to do this? Have they been doing it? No, okay, y you know, judgment time. Judgment time. The very God who called these points of creation into being can call them to act as witnesses of the covenant to acknowledge their faithfulness or in this case their unfaithfulness and what are they called to do they're called to see if the people have acted with gratitude and with obedience it's on this basis that god has a platform to actually accuse his people this is very similar to some of the prophetic indictments found in uh, Micah chapter 6, for example. Whoops, that's not how you spell Micah. There you go. Micah chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. God is calling the very creation to act as a witness for the prosecution. And so along with the people, uh, along with creation, then the people of God are also gathered. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Gather to me the faithful ones. Now, some people think that there's a separation between the faithful ones and who we're going to talk to or who we're going to see later, and there may very well be. This indicates that there is a separation amongst the faithful who are amongst God's people and who we look at later are the wicked amongst God's people. The problem is that as you go into a post-exilic mindset, a post-Babylon mindset for the people of God, there are no faithful ones. There might have been at various points those that were faithful to the covenant, but in the end, it does not really matter. Gathered to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So this becomes a theme. This covenant and sacrifice becomes a theme of the following section. So we get to verse 7 through 15 which constitutes the very first uh, accusation that God makes against his people. This is what he says. Here, now at this point, I should note, at this point, it's not the psalmist who's speaking. Who's speaking here? God is speaking. The psalmist is acting as a prophet, the mouthpiece of God. These are God's 
actual spoken words to the prophet and from the prophet to the people. So here's what it says. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all, the, all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. I, do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. With the invitation of all creation and all, all the gathered people in the background, the voice of the, the Lord here takes center stage. With the exception of verse 14. Verse 14 is kind of an aside that the prophet um, adds as an explanatory note for what God has said. Uh, this entire section, though, for the most part, takes God as, the, as, as, on the, as on the stand about what the people have done. Yeah, Bruce. Is he saying in like verse 9 and 10, is he trying to say, go out and get your own sacrifice, don't take one of mine? Uh, no, so here's, what, here's what's happening here. So some people will read this, and, and some, of the, some of the other prophets will actually make a case that says the sacrifices mean nothing. Right, so some of the other prophecies you'll read uh, will kind of make this kind of indicate that the prophecies don't mean anything. And that's actually not what's happening here. It's not the prophecies that are, it's not the sacrifices that are the problem. The sacrifices are not the problem. Note what he says: "Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you." It's not the actual act and action of sacrifice that is the problem. What is the problem? If you can look at it, what would you say the problem is? attitude, motivation. This is the key, this is the key problem for, for, for all worshipers, really. It's not, the, it's not that the sacrificial system was flawed. It's that the people were flawed. The people were flawed. For, for one thing, they were flawed in their mentality about what the sacrifices did. Their, their, their attitude was a little bit pagan. Not a little bit pagan, sometimes very pagan. They had this mentality that the sacrifices were about appeasing Yahweh, like, like the sacrifices of the other gods of the ancient Near Eastern societies. Like, like if you wanted an end to the drought, you would sacrifice, I don't know, like a hundred bulls to the Baals, because obviously Baal will, will give you the food that you need if you give Baal the food that he needs, Right? Um, if you wanted fertility, you would sacrifice. I'm just, I, I don't know these things. I'm just giving you, like, for instances. I'm not an ancient, uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, pagan ritual expert. Uh, in my spare time, I'm working on it. But, um, but it would be like, you know, we, we're, trying to, we're, we're trying to increase the fertility of a society, so they would sacrifice a thousand of some animal as though the god um, had a need for that. And, and the reason that the god uh, of that particular society was withholding that blessing or that favor was because they were hungry. And, and God was like, are you stupid? That's not how I am. Like, I don't, I don't eat like you eat. I'm not like you. That's not what the sacrifice is all about. The sacrifice, God is saying essentially, the sacrifice is not about me needing something from you. Because does God have any needs? Zero. He is complete in all ways. Perfect in all ways. He has no need for the sacrifice. The one true God. It's almost comical how he, he highlights that. In verse 13, and, 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 uh, verse 13 it's, almost, um, it's almost like a, a joke. He's like, do, do, I, do I eat the flesh of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? You're, you're pouring out the blood of goats like you think I drink that stuff? I'm drinking lattes, man. No, that's not, that's not what God, that's 
And God says, look, if I was hungry, if I were hungry, verse 12, would I, I wouldn't even tell you about it. Because everything is mine anyway. If I really got hungry, I'd just scoop the thing up and stuff it in my mouth. I wouldn't need you to tell me or to bring a sacrifice to me. That's not what the sacrificial system is about. They don't understand. This is not a call to stop sacrificing. It's a call to reorient their attitude and their motivation. What is the attitude they should come with? There's a word here. Verse 14 is the explanatory note. What is it? Thanksgiving. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. It's not about trying to earn your place before God. It's about remembering that God's given you a place and being thankful for it. Even then, that's what it was about. Not just, we say, oh, well, that's in Jesus Christ. It's not just in Jesus. The problem that the people of God had when Jesus came along is they thought the sacrifices gave them a place before God. They thought it was their rituals that made them holy. And it wasn't. The, the rituals and the sacrifices were important only insofar as they reminded the people of their dependence and their need of God. The sacrifices were to be a, a, a reminder of everything that God, we have everything that we need because God has given it to us, so we, we're sacrificing it as, an, as a reminder of what God has done for us. This is why we take up a tithe and offering in service on Sundays. It's not so you can pay your indulgences to the Pope and buy, that was a Reformation reference right there. It's so that you, it, it's as a reminder that, that God has already given you that. It's not yours anyway. And that God would use those gifts, those resources, to bring other people in that we can actually share in the mission of God. So the idea here is that the people could never, ever, ever earn their place before God. But when they sacrifice, they're reminded of their place with God. And from that position, verse 15 is so important. And this is like the, a big chunk of the Psalms is about, number, about verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God says, look, I've given you this grace, this position. When you sacrifice, it's not making me love you any more, any less. So quit acting like um, I owe you something. I'm giving you something as a gift of grace. But you can still come to me in the day of trouble right? Oh God, our refuge and strength. I think we, we, we read that pretty recently, didn't we? A very present, always around help in what? Times of all kinds of trouble. So that's the, 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 the nature of the sacrifice is not the problem. It's the attitude of the sacrificer. And this is what is at the heart of of verses 7 through 15. The sacrifice is about reliance, it's about gratitude, it's about dependence. God promises deliverance in times of trouble. But the indictments against the people don't start with their attitude in the sacrifice. It continues in their failure to observe the law. This is what the psalmist continues as he speaks the word, very word of God here. He says, but, the, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son these things you have done, and I've kept silent, and you thought I was like, I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. So from God's speech about the right attitude of sacrifice, he moves against the people for their disobedience. Now, 
the address, as I pointed out, is specifically to the wicked. Now, there's a separation then in this, and I, I mentioned this at the beginning, there's a separation then between the faithful and the wicked. Now, it's obvious, though, that the wicked have made a covenant. Because he says, the covenant is on your lips. He says, what right do you have to do that? What right do you have to, to take the covenant on your lips? But there is a, a, a distinct difference between the faithful who take the covenant on their lips and those who take the covenant on their lips and then throw it away. And he makes that distinction. Now, the word Bible commentary imagines the liturgical kind of uh, outgrowth or the liturgical enactment of this psalm. So remember, the psalms were used in a worship setting, so the, the, the imagination of the commentators, based on research, it's not just guesswork, is that during this particular psalm, or this particular portion of the psalm, they'd actually separate some of the people. There would be those that were separated as the wicked, and when the wicked were addressed, the priest or the orator of that worship service would direct that, that comment to them. I would not want to be picked in that group. I want to be picked in the group where they're looking at me. Everybody else is like, yeah, see, you're the wicked one. I don't know how they would pick that. But there's definitely some biblical warrant for that belief that, a wor that the worship service would have that. If you look at Deuteronomy 27, for example, in Deuteronomy 27, you get um, part of the covenant renewal uh, worship service. And some of the people, some of the tribes were placed on Mount Gerizim so that they could receive the blessing of the covenant. Some of the tribes were placed on Mount Ebal to receive the cursings of the covenant. So there's blessings for covenant fidelity and there are cursings for covenant unfaithfulness. If you look at Deuteronomy 27, that's explicitly what it says. And it was to act as a visual reminder that there would be times when the people were faithful and they weren't faithful, and when they were faithful, blessing, when they were unfaithful, cursing. This was the breaking of the, uh, breaking of the covenant. And what does that look like? The reminder of Deuteronomy 27 and, 20, and then into 28, it outlines the very specific uh, actions which would constitute a curse and those which would constitute blessing. Um, the theory that that, that that kind of scenario of separation of people, uh, the theory that that's applied to Psalm 50 is interesting, but difficult to tell if that's exactly how it played out. There is warrant to believe that, however. At any rate, we do know, as I said earlier, that all the people were constituted at one point as wicked. They were constituted as disobedient and deserving of exile. They had claimed the covenant. They had claimed that, the co that they would observe the covenant. They had even, even been faithful in the observant of their sacrifices, but they broke the key terms of the covenant in the most basic ways. The most basic covenant uh, par uh, parts or the most basic covenant stipulations are found in Exodus 20. That's the Ten Commandments. That's the most basic covenant stipulations. In fact, all the other laws in the Old Testament, in, the, you know, in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are outworkings of the Ten Commandments. And so what happens in Psalm 50 is that many of the verses in Psalm 50 directly coincide with the Ten Commandments. Look at it. You see stealing. You see adultery. You see false witness or lying. They're all condemned with the further implications that they bear out. Stealing was an act of distrust. It was a distrust that God would provide for the person. And that's, that goes right back to the, what we just talked about in the sacrifice. The sacrifice w were meant to be uh, examples or, or demonstrations of a person's trust in God. Stealing is the exact opposite of that. Uh, adultery was often used, especially in prophets like Hosea, it was often used as a metaphor for the spiritual infidelity of the people. 
false witness. There's a denial of the truth, which is at the heart of what God says. All that God says is truth. All of it is truth. And so to bear false witness is an affront to the God of truth. All truth is God's truth. You've heard me probably say that multiple times. No matter who says it, all truth is God's truth. But all lies are antithetical to God. And they, again, they represent a distrust of God. You you think back to Genesis 3 again. At the heart of the failure of Adam and Eve is a belief in a false witness. Because who comes in? The serpent. What does the serpent say? What does the serpent do? What does the serpent try to do? He tries to cast a dispersion on the truth or the trustworthiness of God's word. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve goes, no, 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 we can eat of any of the tree. But we can't eat of this tree. And if we eat of it, what does she say? Or touch it, which is not what God said. If we do, you will surely die, which God did say. And what does, that, what does the serpent say? You're not going to die. God knows that when you eat of this fruit, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. What is what, what, what has the serpent done? He's borne false witness against God. He said, God is a liar. That's what he said. That's essentially it. You don't get around. I mean, that's, you want to put it in a nutshell. The serpent says to Adam and Eve, God's a liar. He said this, but really what he's doing is he's holding out on you. Never mind that he's already made them like God in his image in the way that they're supposed to be. And so when they fail, they demonstrate a lack of trust in God and his trustworthiness. And it seems like to our eyes, we see people who are thieves, verse 18. We see uh, those who are adulterers, also verse 18. Verse 19, those who bear fault. We see all those things, don't we? In life, we see that. We see people. It not, we might not actually witness somebody breaking into like a bank or something, but we hear stories all the time about people who steal and seem to get away with it or, or commit adultery, and that's, that's not a crime anymore, and you know that sort of thing. We're like, what, what's happening? And it seems as though God is silent. These things you have done, and I've been silent. And because of that, people think that God's just like them or that there is no God. And there are definitely times when it seems as though God is silent. And in fact, God is silent at times. But God's silence in the face of evil and the face of disobedience against his word, it's always temporary. It's always for a time and for a purpose. Now, do we know what that purpose is always? No. Actually, we rarely know what God's purpose is in staying silent in the face of evil is. He relents sometimes. But those who deny him, those who deny his instruction, what does he say in verse 22? Mark this, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. God says, I rebuke you, and I lay the charge before you. Silence is just for a little while. The condemnation will be forever. So in verse 23, the author basically summarizes the two cases against the people. This is what he writes. And this is the voice of the prophet at this this moment. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. Sorry, this is still the voice of God, but it's it's a summary of what God has said. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Two sides of this condemnation. On the one hand, we have the sacrificial system. Sacrifice. Whoops with gratitude 
and don't just make sacrifices. Live as though the sacrifices matter. Living in obedience. And from this will be, will be shown the, sa- the salvation of God. Now again, a lot of folks will look at this as, as though the Jewish people had an earned, uh, an earned salvation, a, a, a covenant of works mentality. And, and the people might have had a covenant of works mentality. Like if we sacrifice with gratitude, okay, we've got it. And if we live rightly, okay, we've got it. Then we're in. Then God owes us salvation. That's not how God intended it, ever. That's not how God intended it, ever. It's about being in the relationship with God, first and foremost. And as an outgrowth of being in that relationship with God, you sacrifice with gratitude. You live according to His instruction. Why? Because you trust that person that you're in a relationship with. This was not an earned salvation. This was not a theology of works righteousness. It's a theology of trust and dependence and reliance. Right worship and demonstrated trust in God's words. That's the way you have a relationship with the Lord. And the outgrowth of a connection with the giver of life is life. That's just, that's how it works. It's like plugging in an appliance to a live electrical socket. It cannot help but have power as long as all that connection works. It cannot help to have power. The same thing is the case with those who follow the Lord. So when we look at the life of Jesus, we see some, some real key connection points with Psalm 50. In, in the first 11 chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul lays out a grand historical theology of redemption. He, he looks from before the beginning of time. He, he, he looks to the creation of the world. He looks at the fall. He looks at Abraham. He looks at Jesus as the second Adam all the way until Jesus Christ. He, he outlines the necessity of having a Savior like Jesus, who is both the perfect fulfillment of the law in his life and the perfect sacrifice that he didn't deserve for the sake of those who had broken the law of God. This is a, 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 it's an obvious point for Paul that the Savior Jesus was a necessity based on the law and based on our inability to, to, to uh, hold on to the law. And he, he, he also demonstrates that because of Jesus, we have the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, so now we can live into obedience. And this is where he makes a turn from the first 11 chapters to chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 1, you guys know what he says. Therefore, in view of God's mercies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Note the the words there. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then notice what he does in verse 2. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Two sides of Psalm 50, two sides of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Actually, the whole of Romans sacrifice and obedience. It's a different type of sacrifice in light of Jesus Christ. It's a different type of obedience in light of Jesus Christ. But it's still sacrifice and obedience. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of obedience and sacrifice, and so he enables those in gratitude to worship him and obey the Lord. Not in some earned earned works righteousness sort of way, but in view of the mercies of God, he says in view of all that God has already done for us, in view of the connection that we have to Jesus, what we know as eternal salvation, it's because of Jesus' sacrifice that we, as living sacrifices, can be transformed and conformed and not conformed to the order of this world. But actually, he offers the promise of living into the perfect, good, and pleasing will of God. This is grace. 
that God provides not only a way to salvation, but a way to obedience by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 50, Romans 12, causes us to ask, how are we at relying on the Lord? And how are we demonstrating that reliance in our lives? Next week, we're going to see in Psalm 51 what happens when disobedience runs rampant, even for a short period of time, in the life of a faithful person. Uh, Psalm 51 is the, probably the most raw of all the psalms in terms of its focus on repentance. Are there any questions from Psalm 50? Psalm 51 is a confessional psalm that it's a little bit of a... It's not, it's not prophecy for sure. It's not prophecy. This is a very personal psalm. Some people would probably consider it a psalm of a lament, but it's more of a personal psalm of repentance. It's unique. And it's, uh, one, it's one that when we get to it, I don't want to spoil too much because I know you guys are all chomping at the bit for excitement and stuff. But um, it's one of the psalms that we are very highly confident that the superscription or the title coincides perfectly with the content of the actual psalm itself. It's the lowest point of David's life. The lowest. Without a second. And that's pretty, that's pretty, that's saying something because David had his father-in-law try to kill him three times. He had his son try to kill him a couple times and usurp the throne. But this is the lowest point of David's life. It is a cleansing. It is a cleansing. But it's, that's why it's a psalm of repentance. But it's, it's kind of one of those things. The interesting thing about David's life is that, you know, David has this trajectory, this faith trajectory. And, I, and it's one of the things I love about the... It's, it's one of the major things I love about the Scripture in general is that it's a very real in its assessment of even its heroes, right? So David has this pretty steady uh, spiritual um, incline, and a massive precipitous fall, and then only a kind of a slight personal incline, but his entire life just falls entirely apart after it. And it's and I will just so tie it to Psalm fifty. It's all because the trust and obedience went away. Yep. Yep. That's why it's. Thematically, they do tie in together. One of the other things, and I, I didn't say this because I, I don't know how I don't know if I agree with this assessment. One of the one of the reasons that this Psalm of Asaph from Psalm fifty is right before Psalm fifty one, some people believe, is because the Psalm editors wanted examples of the sons of Korah and Asaph before getting to the this collection. So we're going to get this is a this Psalm 51 present uh, introduces a, another collection of the Psalms of David. So there's several collections of Psalms of David in the book of Psalms. Um, and so some commentators believe okay, well the the writers really wanted to put an example of an Asaph psalm beginning in section 2 at the front end of section 2 before the larger collection in 73 through 83. But I think, I think that the thematic connection between 47, 48, 49 is bigger than, than most commentators um, recognize. And you're right, there's a, a connection at the end to Psalm 51. I think that's there. And remember... Were these psalms written together? No. They were written at very different times, but, but, but they were combined for a purpose. And the combina- I just think the combination is really how these psalms are lined up is so interesting. I've, and I've said this before in this, in this class, I have always read the psalms kind of independent of one another. Like I've read all the psalms straight through before, but I, when, when I've read them, I've never thought of, okay, there's a, there's a link, with the exception of like Psalm 9 and 10 and Psalm 22 and 23 and Psalm 42 and 43, things like that. I've never thought, well, how does Psalm 47 relate to Psalm 50? 
never thought of that before. This is like the first time I've really dug into the thematic connections and why the editors put the Psalms together the way they did. And I think they do that for great theological reasons. To your point, I think that's a, I think those are, I think what happens in Psalm 50 bears out in Psalm 51 in a personal way. You've got this very, very corporate uh, prophecy of correction. And then Psalm 51, this Psalm of repentance, very personal that is a response to the correction, because we're going to go back into the life of David and see the correction that happened at the voice of a prophet, right? I'm spoiling too much of it. Now you got me going into next week. Maybe we need to, because next week's going to be a doozy. All right, guys, well, let's pray, and we'll uh, head to uh, worship. Lord, thank you so much that you love us and that you connect uh, so deeply with us. And Lord, we just pray that as we worship you, we would do so with gratitude and reliance at our, uh, in our hearts, and then our lives would be filled with examples of obedience for you. Pray that you move in us, in Jesus' name, amen.